Hey, friends. This story is about Mojo Nixon, but it, it starts out in the mid-'90s in the north side of Indianapolis. I lived in a neighborhood called Broad Ripple. And it's the sort of neighborhood that you found yourself in if you didn't fit in. Say you're a, a young person and you're just looking for something different. If you're a punk rocker, if you're a hippie, if you're a hip-hop kid, if you're gay, if you just didn't feel comfortable in the suburbs anymore and wanted to get away from some of those folks, you found yourself into this neighborhood. And it was a great neighborhood. It was a beautiful place to be. I really loved my neighbors. And as sometimes happen, when all of the misfits and weirdos move in, you have this sweet spot before everybody else finds out about it. And we were living in that sweet spot where it's cheap, there's creative people doing cool things, and it's just good life. And then all of a sudden, all of the people who you moved out of the suburbs to get away from, they find out that this is some kind of a hip place to hang out, so they start coming there. And as they did, there would be fights at night between frat boys and just people who didn't respect the neighborhood the same way that we did since we lived there. And um, I would see this every night on the way home from, from work. I'd work the door at a place called the patio, and I would just see people fighting, people harassing gay people, you know, these, these guys, 23-year-old males from the suburbs, coming in and behaving badly. And the cops did not think these clean-cut kids from the suburbs were any problem whatsoever. They thought that the weirdos were the problem. They thought that the people who actually lived there, like myself, you know, they looked, these kids looked strange. They must be up to some problems. So the cops were always messing with uh, my friends and I and not taking care of the real problem, which was the, the clean-cut white kids that came in from the suburbs and, you know, beating up people. So that's our backdrop. Sometime in the mid-'90s, Mojo Nixon played at the patio and I remember it was summertime. I think it was in July. I don't remember what year. But I went to the show. It was just a beautiful rock and roll show. If you've ever been to a Mojo Nixon show, it's a really, really good time. Mojo has always had this clear understanding that rock and roll contains a certain amount of wop bop a loo a lot bamboo. I remember that evening was beautiful. It was a great show. It was a very high energy and fun. And I was, you know, you just kind of release all that tension that you're feeling. I remember walking out of the club that night, feeling great. I walk out onto the street, Guilford Avenue, in front of the club. And right there in front of me are three young frat boys pissing on the yellow line right in the middle of the road. And all of this stuff from the last however many few months or a year just kind of all hit me at once. And I remember I ran out into the middle of the street and I just started yelling at these guys and I was cussing them. I was just, you know, flinging expletives every which way I could, just yelling at them. And I'm a very peaceful person and I have no intentions of getting into a fight with anybody, but they don't know that. So they see me, this hairy hobo looking guy, just screaming at them and, uh, you know, call them every name in the book, and they started getting scared. They don't realize there's three of them and one of me, but they all start backing up. And I'm just yelling and yelling, and uh, you come in, you don't, you know, you don't behave this way in your own neighborhood. Why do you come to my neighborhood and behave this way? What's, you, what's the matter with you? Why don't you think about this sort of thing? I'm yelling like this. Time goes by, and I'm kind of running out of things to yell. And slowly they start realizing I'm just a guy yelling and there's three of them and there's only one of me and it kind of turns around and they start yelling at me and I kind of realize, oh my God, I'm about to get my ass kicked. And I start backing up a little bit and they're yelling and they're walking slowly towards me and calling me every name in the book. You know, you think you're tough. And I'm backing up like, oh, man, here it comes, here it comes. And uh, I'm about to take my medicine, and I bump into something. And I stop, and I kind of turn around, and it's Mojo Nixon. And he's standing there in the middle of the street. And uh, 
everybody kind of stops and looks at him. And Mojo looks like your weird uncle that works at a gas station that nobody really talks about. He might have done time. He might be involved in some really, you know, underhanded stuff. You just don't want to try him. You don't know. Well, he's got that weird look in his eyes where he might not be afraid of prison. You don't know, so you don't try. Mojo has that look. He looks over at me and he's like, Man, these damn frat boys are the same way every town I go in. They show up and they start disrespecting the neighborhood and blah, blah. And he starts yelling at them way better than I yelled at him. I mean, way better. And he's flailing and he's spitting when he's talking, just going off. And these guys just completely back down, all three of them. And after a while of him yelling at them, he's got it to where they apologized to me and uh, promised to not do it again and went on their way. He's like, man, I can't believe it. Everywhere I go, these frat boys are the same. It's always this kind of thing happening all the time. He looks at me. He's like, what's your name, man? You're all right. He kind of puts his arm around me. I said, my name's Otis. And uh, he's like, you're all right, man. Come on. Let's go back inside and have some fun. So we went inside and we sat at the bar for a little bit. Really good time. The whole evening kind of cleaned itself up and I, I felt better about life. And Mojo Nixon saved me from getting my ass kicked. Quite a few years go by, and I've been touring and making albums and uh, just making a tiny bit of progress any way I can here and there. Mojo Nixon is a disc jockey in serious XM Outlaw Country. He starts playing my records, and he starts playing them a lot. I mean, like every day he's spinning them a whole lot, which is a very cool thing, and I was very appreciative of it. I'm in Austin, Texas at the Continental Club just hanging out. And I looked across the bar, and there's Mojo Nixon. And I thought, man, I got to go talk to Mojo. I got to walk. So I walk over, and uh, I said, hey, Mojo. And it's really loud. Somebody's playing. And I said, hey, Mojo, um, my name is Otis Gibbs, and you've been playing my records, and I really appreciate it. I just want you to know that. He said, you're Otis? And said, yeah. And he said, come here, come here. And we walk out the back door, and we walked into the alley. And we stood out there for a while talking, and he but man, I'll tell you what, that that preacher Steve, that's some jams, man. That damn me. I've been playing that. That's and I appreciate that, man. Thank you very much. And no, man, that's good stuff. And uh, I said, Mojo, this is a long time ago, and I don't know if you will remember this, but I I, I told him the story. I said, Mojo, you saved me from getting my ass kicked that night, and I just want you to know I appreciate it. He says, You're not just trying to make old Mojo feel good, are you? And I said, no, it's the truth, man. And he said, that's, that's, not, that's not a story you made up? I said, do you not remember that? And he says, no, I don't remember that at all. And uh, of course he doesn't remember it. That was every night of Mojo Nixon's life, was fighting frat boys, you know, having fun after the show and going and yelling at people who were pissing in the middle of the street, being a superhero. I said, I just want you to know how much I appreciate that, and thank you for spinning my records. And then I run into him. You know, every year or two, I'll run into him somewhere. I think uh, somewhere a couple years after that, a few years after that, I saw him at the Mercy Lounge in Nashville. I gave him a ride home back to his uh, hotel room that night. So he knew I didn't drink or anything. And uh, um, he had told me another time outside the Continental Club that um, he said, man, I like that new song of yours about the catfish. That's a lot better than them songs you wrote about your feelings. I just want you to know that. <laughs> I said, I appreciate that. He's like, no, that's a good song, man. That song about that catfish. I'm going to make that a hit. And, uh, man, he played the hell out of that song. He's played that every day since then. So I appreciate that. I guess the final chapter in the Mojo saga here that I'll leave you guys with is uh, another time in Austin I was supposed to meet him at his hotel room there in Austin. And uh, I remember going up and I knock on the door and he answers the door. He's like, hey, come on in, Otis, come on in. And I'm like, hey, man, how are you doing? And he says, well, somebody locked himself in the bathroom last night. I had to piss in the trash can. I apologize for the smell. And to this day, I have no idea whether he was telling the truth or joking or what. But that's kind of life when you're mojo. But that's the story of how Mojo Nixon saved me from getting an ass whooping. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy that. Please subscribe and uh, like and comment. Tell me your Mojo Nixon stories. 
I think my first memories of Mojo Nixon were seeing those MTV commercials or saying there's nothing wrong with you that a one foghorn and leghorn cartoon couldn't cure. Anyway, thanks, guys. Take care. <laughs> I can't leave out here. Kirk! <laughs> <laughs>